actually we'll do this kind of jointly, so Albert will step in later on because I would be talking about work that he was crucially involved in and uh, it would feel funny for me to talk about that when I'm sitting there. So anyway, this is the outline of, the, of what we want to do. Um, so I will recall a few things about quantum walks um, and the, the quantity that we are mostly interested in is the asymptotic position of such a quantum walk. So in a quantum walk you have by interference somehow between different spatial locations of the, of the walking particle, um, you, you get the, well, the distribution spreads out more and more and um, you would like to be able to compute that and well this is not something essentially new but I would like to emphasize uh, the physicist's way of computing such things which actually then also generalizes to uh, looking at one kind of disorder in this case. So we're, the main theme of this talk then will be to see how this spreading of uh, wave packets of quantum walks is influenced when we start wiggling the system a little bit. And there are two ways of doing that. One is doing it with a random coin, that is, in each time step we change the coin a little bit, but keep the translation in the other way to do that is to, to change the point of the quantum walk at every point in space or at, at every point on the lattice, um, but keep that constant in time. So, of course, you could also combine these two, but then we don't know anything. But act, these, these, two, these two are sort of paradigms of how you could wiggle the coin, and they have very different effects on, uh, on the quantum walk. Uh, so this, this comparison is, a, is the main theme then of the talk. Okay, so quantum walk basics, I mentioned, basically mentioned it yesterday already, so I can be quick. So there would be one spatial degree of freedom, typically on a square lattice, you can always take a square lattice if you want. Um, some of the results, and certainly the pictures, are going to be in one dimension, so one space dimension. Uh, there's an eternal degree of freedom, which is also point, called a coin space, and the Hilbert space would be then the, the, the CD value functions on the uh, lattice. The dy dynamic time step is, is unitary, called W now for walk, and it has this locality property that it only connects sites which are not too far apart, so there's a fixed length L um, up to which you can go, and uh, well, translation invariant walks are characterized by the property that this unitary commutes also with the translations. Okay, so you can also look at noisy walks uh, and they, in, in, the, in the time random version they do come up sort of. Um, but um, anyway, we're mostly looking at the unitary. So why do we want to do that? I'll be quick here. First of all, we are mostly interested in several automata also as computational models. But uh, this, this so, so this is a simple laboratory to, to study some notions for quantum cell automata. Um, I gave you some examples yesterday that actually understanding the walks is helpful in getting structural results also for this more complicated case. Um, the good thing is also that they are realizable now. I mean, there is no interesting or few interesting cell automata are realized in a clean way so far. Situations, whereas walks, there are some quite nice ones that seriously implement this, these ideas. Then I talked yesterday about, about the interplay of locality of un and unitarity. That's what interests me. And uh, well, as you, as we'll see today, you can have a look at what decoherence does to these complicated interference effects that make up a walk. And uh, of course. Walks also come up in search algorithms. And then that's another motivation for study. So how do we make a walk? Well, here's a simple thing. You can take, so these, each of these lines corresponds to a qubit. Time is going from bottom to top. And uh, each box is a unitary acting on just two of them. So this is a circuit that makes one step of a possible quantum walk. Um, Actually, in some sense, this is already the most general in one dimension. If you don't have shifts, that was a result of yesterday's index, index lecture. Um, so, 
if you think of walkers, ah, sorry, yeah, this is actually for a cellular automaton, and the, the, the walk case is uh, contained in that by saying that only one of these cubic lines is occupied. And the unitaries respect that property, so it's a quantum particle that is a diffuse in a coherent way. Okay, so the particular way of doing that is to have the first layer as some kind of shift operation that depends on the internal state. This is indicated by these red lines. And then comes a coin operation, which at each, for each, at each site um, performs a unitary transformation. So this will be a fixed operation. So we can actually write it as a tensor product of a coin, op a coin operation on the coin space with, uh, with doing nothing on the translation degree of freedom. Um, so we need this state-dependent transport. Um, so that has to depend on the internal state, otherwise we don't get anything interesting. And I mentioned the point. So for the moment, I'll look at trans the translation invariant case, which means that all the points are the same. We'll change that later. Now, in the translation invariant case, oops, what is this? Uh, that was an animation gone wrong. You saw the word fully transform. So this is the reflex of a... Um, um, it was moving in from further there, and then I moved it by hand to the, to the right, not knowing that this thing is animal. So, um, so looking at something that is translation invariant, um, in, a, in a theoretical physicist all should immediately trigger the Fourier transform effect uh, reflex. Right? So, of course, if something commutes with the translations, then you could jointly diagonalize it with the translation. So let's do that. So this is a this is a Fourier transform um, for the for the functions on the lattice. So in the lattice variables gets Fourier transformed to momentum variable, and the momentum variable lies in the in the Brillouin zone, or which is another way of saying it's on the torus. Right? So the e, we write this as e to the i p x. So the p is something that uh, x would be integer values, right? So the p is a vector in the, in the cube minus pi to pi to the s um, with the appropriate identifications. Now the commutation with, a, with a, uh, the, the random, so the quantum walk commuting with the translation means that um, it acts in the Fourier transform picture just by the multiplication with the unitary matrix. So this is then called W of P there. And uh, so this is the full walk operator. And it acts sort of separately for every P um, as a unitary matrix for every value of the momentum. Right? So this is joint diagonalization. And um, so the entries of this W of P now are are polynomials into in the variables e to the i p x, if you want, right? or p p r p j or whatever the components of p. So there are different p's, that, different values of p up to the space dimension, and you make polynomials in these trigonometric functions. That's uh, that's what you get from the Fourier transform. They are polynomials because the range of the walk is only finite. So if l is uh, the maximum number of steps that you you can get. Um, the highest power of e to the ip that you would find in there would be l. Right? So this is um, okay. So this it's a it's a matrix of polynomials, and uh, so so we really have just have to study that. Right? So take make d by d matrices, and each entry is one of these polynomials, but they have to be unitary for every value of p. Right? So that's the constraint. So how can you make them? Well, there is a structure theorem that tells you how to do that. This is valid only in one dimension. So, the, so in, in, of course, you can use it as a, as, a, as a toolbox to build such walks. So you have coins. So those, uh, those would be oper unitary operations that don't contain the value of p. Of course, any, any such unitary <coughs> operator is OK. But they would just correspond to the local operations without any shift. Then you can make shifts, and then only have shifting phases on the diagonal, like e to the i and p in, in some entry on the diagonal would shift that component by n. And um, 
you can have various configurations of that. And then you multiply together a couple of those and you get one of these unitary matrices. Right? So this is actually how you could generate a typical random quantum walk and just combine it of, the, of possibly several of those steps. In one dimension, this is the only thing you can do. So you can decompose a given unitary or para-unitary You can decompose them into such steps, but in higher dimensions we do not know this. Um, the index theory actually is, I, I mentioned that yesterday, just take the determinant of this matrix, which is then an invertible polynomial, which means it must be a monomial. So there is an integer vec vector n um, that gives you this determinant. And this would be something like the overall shift that, you, uh, that you're doing with this one. And so many, many interesting walks will have index zero. Okay. It's all about the spreading that there is no superimposed global shift. Okay, so then we have a unitary operator for every P. Now P is one dimensional for simplicity. Uh, and I, 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 for every P I can diagonalize that. So I draw a dot at the eigenvalues of this operator W of P. Now, these are phases, it's a unitary operator, so this actually also, the vertical axis also wraps around, so this is something on the torus. So you should think of this as a picture on the torus. Both variables are Fourier variables of discrete things, discrete time and discrete space, so they actually wrap around. So this is to be, seen, to be read with periodic boundary conditions. Um, the number of branches at every point P will be the dimension of the point space. So there's one, two, three, four, five in this case. Okay, so, so this, the index turns out to be the winding number of this curve around the torus. Um, and in the higher dimension you would, you would get things like that. So you have two momentum variables. And uh, so if you actually, so this is a single surface. Uh, yes, I think it, yeah, it's, it's, it's a single surface which you can glue together. You should think of this as with boundary conditions, periodic boundary conditions in every direction. So if you go out on this surface, you come back on that. Right? So it's a single surface. Uh, and if you look at the index, well, by inspection more or less, you can find that the index is 1 or minus 1. So the index is now a vector in the lattice, this n vector. Okay, so the, the, these bands, these lines, eigenvalue lines, can cross, but if you take random, uh, if you take random uh, coin points somehow, I mean you, you just ge randomly generate an example of this, then the, the so-called phenomenon of avoided crossing would typically mean that they don't really cross. So you can make crossings, but these you have to make by hand. If you make yet random examples, they always avoid the crossing and they bend like that. So this is actually this is how I generated these, and this is why these bands don't intersect. Okay, so what is asymptotic position? We start with the preparation, let's say, at x equals zero, and then we just let go. So this is a simple simple run. Well, we plot psi absolute square with an initial wave function that is peaked at the origin, and you see these two peaks uh, running running off to infinity somehow. Now, there was a, there was a time at quantum information conferences where people were very thrilled about this. So there's a quantum walks community that computed that in analogy this this distribution in analogy with classical random walks, which you can think of as a combinatorial problem. So there is a combinatorial, the classical random walk just tells you, gives you binomial coefficients, so you can think of this as a combinatorial problem, so people were applying similar methods to computing this distribution, which was a pain in the neck. Um, so I would like to, to show you how to do this more efficiently, and see what the asymptotic distribution of this is. And how far, where are these peaks, how far do they move, what is the shape that you see there for, for a large number of steps. Okay, um, 
And of course, we want to do this for an arbitrary initial state and in, a, in as simple a way as possible. Right? Okay, um, so one, one thing to notice is that this, this distribution doesn't converge. Well, it does. It can, it can converge to something which is flat and everywhere zero. Um, so that's not what we want. We want to make an appropriate scaling so that we can that that this this thing has a chance to go to a reasonable probability distribution, and with an appropriate scaling we can talk about anything. So there are two candidates here, namely uh, so the Q of t is now the position variable uh, at time t, right, using t steps of this unitary w, and we can look at what, I, what is called the ballistic scaling, that is we look at the operator limit of Q of T divided by T. The operator limit means that we, at the same time, we're not just taking the limit of the mean values, but in the limit, um, but, but also if we take any function of, of, of Q of T uh, and scale it in the, in the appropriate way, we get the probability distribution, full probability distribution converging. Right? So proving an operator limit equation is really the the same as also proving the convergence of the probability distributions that you get generated with that. So, um, okay, so, so that's one possible scaling, which means that we would, uh, we would take this spreading figure, scale it by 1 over t, and then it would sort of stabilize. And the other possible limit that I will discuss is I call diffusive scaling. And there, well, apart from a possible drift that we subtract, uh, the typical scaling is one of the square root. This is what you expect in a classical random walk. Right? So this is why it's called diffusive. Ballistic is like throwing things. Uh, there is a constant velocity there. Whereas diffusive is the kind of speed that you have in a diffusive particle. Okay, so these are the two basic options. Of course, if if the ballistic scaling makes sense, the diffusive, diffusive scaling will give you infinity unless the drift is very well defined. So the, the appropriate scaling in a certain situation depends on the system. Right? So we'll see that both have their applications. So um, I already said that. So, um, okay, so how do we do this computation? And I'll do that. So let, let me just go through this uh, quickly. So there is a simple, thing, simple compu computation you can do. And the main idea here is based on looking at this expectation value of an exponential of the Q, of the position uh, variable. We scale this by T, as we should, we, if we want to compute the limit of that. So this is by the rules of the book what we should write for that. And it turns out that we can think of this as a somewhat modified version of the time translation operator. The time translation operator, which is, just has W star T and W T on the other side. And we modify it by multi multiplying the second factor here with these factors involving Q. Okay. So the basic idea is compute the characteristic function and realize that this is a uh, note that this is somehow a modification of the time translation operator itself by a parameter, this lambda here, will be a fixed thing in the limit, but here it becomes divided by t. And this is simply because the lambda of t combination naturally shows up. And so we can use perturbation theory of this eigenvector. So we have these, these are the modified operators, right? And powers of that are exactly what appears in here. So this, the perturbation theory of this thing at epsilon equals zero is what governs the asymptotic distribution. And uh, so we just have to do the perturbation theory. Now, uh, this op these operators still commute with the, uh, with the translations. This is a quick computation to do that. Nothing deep there. Uh, and the way they act is really you multiply the unitary at point P with a shifted one. And from that, you could you could take the limit that we need, right? So the um, let, let me go over the technical details quickly. 
So if, if this is the spectral resolution of the walk operator, now the W of P is a polynomial for every P, but the eigenprojections are not. Right? So the diagonalization process uh, is certainly not something that you could write explicitly as a polynomial. So therefore the R alpha of P will be complicated objects in general. Let's assume that for the moment that this is, this is non-degenerate. And then we can, we can compute this perturbation theory of this, uh, of this T epsilon operator, uh, giving something like that. So, so here is the two values of this phase, W of P, that come up, come up. And one is at a shifted position. And they get subtracted from each other by the rules of combining U's and U stars. Right? So um, essentially what you have in the exponent there um, the limit is just a gradient of the velocity of, of the of the uh, of the eigenvalue omega alpha. Right? So if you summarize that, you get the following result. So if you, if this is a spectral resolution of the of the warp unitary, which is something that you can compute easily, then the the group velocity operator is defined by this uh, velocity as a gradient of omega. This is something that physicists would be familiar with from, let's say, solid-state physics or so. But there it's, there it's done in the continuous case. And uh, so this, this is the limit. And so this, the, the, the Q, Q of t over t converges to this operator. Which means that for any input state, we can compute the probability, asymptotic probability distribution of the scale position. And it will just be the probability distribution that you get for this operator velocity. It will be a vector operator that has several commuting components and higher dimensions, so you get the full distribution also over the lattice. So here's an example. This is the standard Hadamard walk that people were uh, trying to treat combinatorially. And uh, so I, I, I gave you a picture of the scaled. This is the same picture that you saw. Um, same little stupid film. But now, um, uh, with a scaling in, and you see that this is, uh, looks almost like V convergence. What uh, the blue line is what you get as a limiting distribution. It has a singularity at the peaks, so the peaks that go away uh, actually correspond to singularities of the asymptotic distribution. And this effect is uh, so. This effect I want to explain now. That's called a caustic. Um, so here is the here is the eigenvalue picture, which is easy. Here's the picture of derivatives. So this is the spectrum of the velocity operator. Right? And now if we, if we take a particle starting at zero, the momentum distribution is flat. Right? The Fourier transform of a delta function is a flat uh, wave function in, in momentum space. So if we take an interval near the uh, near the maximum of these velocity curves, we get more probability into that than from anywhere where the slope is finite. So the vanishing of the slope of this function at the maximum means that I get a diverging probability distribution. So this is called cost. And, uh, and so the, this is a corresponding picture. The, the lines there are artifacts from the numerics, but I simply took a two-dimensional walk, computing the, the asymptotic distribution like that. And you see these more caustic, like what, what you may, may want to, I mean, caustics are the results of a projection of a higher dimensional surface to a lower dimension. And this is the sort of picture that you would get then in higher dimension. So this is how to, um, I think I'll go over this quickly. You can, uh, uh, you can produce things that move with a speed of light by using the non-commutativity of... So this would be a possible band structure in two dimensions. And there are singularities here. So in, in one dimension, bands can cross, but you can always find analytic branches through. Um, in, two, in higher dimensions, so if there are more parameters in your, uh, on which your perturbation depends, then... Um, the perturbations in the different directions don't have to commute. And therefore, you cannot find analytic branches and you get singularities like cones. So, you can, this looks like a feed, right? 
That's, yeah, this is graphene, yes. Great. <laughs> so this is a simple version of the graphene phenomenon. Uh, which exactly. exists in the real nature. I mean, this is not a metal thing, it's a lab thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, <laughs> sure. Well, they, they have continuous time, usually, I guess. But so, so precisely that kind of singularity happens here, and it, it's, it, it can be understood in terms of perturbation theory in two parameters rather than in one. And so here is actually the velocity plot, and it shows you a nice uh, speed of light, right? which is not the speed of light of the walk, right? So there is, of course, there is you, the, the walk could spread with one step at a time at most, but the peaks that go, uh, that, that you see moving, they move at a speed one over the square root of two in the Hadamard case, right? And that, again here, the, the, the maximum speed that the walk can have is larger than this, actually, and also, these corners are missed. Right? So, in principle, there would be some non-zero amplitude out here, but the asymptotic uh, velocity distribution is indeed concentrated on a ball. Um, everything outside the ball gets a zero exponential. Okay, so now, brief philosophy of disorder. So, um, shifts and coins, and I can just choose the coins in whatever way I want. So this is indicated by different colors here, but of course this is too much, and we we would like to focus on two different kinds of disorder. And the two different kinds of disorder actually are related to the time scales on which they happen. So if you if there are some random fluctuating parameters in your experiment, then then everything depends on the time time scales of these things. So if the experiment is faster than these fluctuations, you could say, well, they're, they're fixed for every, in every single run, but from run to run of the experiments, they may be different. And uh, so you would fix the dynamics depending on a random parameter. But then if the time scale is smaller, then the dynamic law itself becomes random. Right? So these are just basically a matter of time scales. How fast are the steps? How fast are the fluctuations? And uh, so this is, this is uh, again, emphasized here. So on short time scales, if the fluctuations are on short time scales, then you get this annealed disorder, this dynamic disorder. And on long time scales, you get the frozen. And for each of them, we now, oh, OK, so these are the different things that you do. The single process, then there's a time scale for the sampling, and the time scale for the whole experiments. Whether from run to run it's the same or not, it depends on whether the fluctuations are faster than you can do your whole experiment take a day or so. So a, a quench disorder is typical for disordered amorphous materials. So crystals with random defects, but they don't move around very fast. So you have the same crystal and you, you're working on it uh, all the time. It's where the, where the impurities are or defects would be, would be a random thing, but from sample to sample it would be the same. So that's a typical example of quench disorder, where the fluctuations are on very large time scales, well, actually infinite. Um, okay, so now for this, for the walks, we look at these two cases. So this would be the quenched case. Right? So everything, so in, in space, the coins are the same, but we don't change them in time. And the other one is the opposite. Uh, we change them very fast, right? but in a transition that I have way. Understand. So, um, so let's look, just briefly. I'll just briefly go over the uh, disorder in time. Uh, the the point of this whole perturbation theory stuff for the asymptotic position distribution is that if you do play precisely that game, uh, you use second order perturbation theory to get the diffusive behavior. So, so the model of disorder is the following. Um, you have a collection of unitary walk unit operators, right? so call them W gamma, gamma is some parameter, and at each time you, you pick one of those. Now, which one you pick, um, you let depend on a Markov chain. Let's say they are finite, this is set, yeah. gamma could be finite, and then you make transitions between the different walks. So you could, you could stick to one for a very long time, but there would be a probability that you change to another one. Uh, gamma to gamma prime maybe should be the uh, transition probability. So you fix the transition probabilities. There would be some assumptions on that. 
And um, so in the simplest case, actually, you would ch ch choose them independently every time, which really corresponds to something that has a, to a, to a noisy walk that has this cross decomposition. So this is really like the cross decomposition uh, of, a, of a noisy walk, um, where in each, in each step, you pick a fresh set of, uh, of well, you, you, you uh, pick a fresh random gamma, and they're independent from, from step to step, which means that this is the, the operator that you apply. So this is a special case. Um, OK, so the, the conclusion, well, there's some conditions on the non-degeneracy of this structure. So the different walk operators shouldn't all commute with a fixed operator, because then you would have constants of the motion that behave differently. So there's a non-degenerating the degeneracy condition, and a condition that the Markov chain as such goes into it. And then, so these, these walks have an index, and the mean index taken with the, with the invariant distribution of the Markov process uh, is actually the drift velocity. So at the ballistic scaling, it becomes deterministic. Right? It becomes like a fixed speed. So the, the, this spreading doesn't happen anymore. And if you scale things down with a factor 1 over t, it looks like it becomes just uh, asymptotically just moves with a fixed speed. I forgot what the index is, please. Uh, the index is this, this uh, determinant, exponent in the determinant of this walk. Each, if each of these w gamma is an ordinary walk, yeah. it's a unitary walk. So you take the determinant, and the, the determinant of this of w gamma will be e to the i index times p. Okay. Okay, so this will be the mean drift velocity. Uh, and, and on the ballistic scale, you don't see any deviations from this. This is a deterministic velocity. So we have something to subtract from the position, right? uh, which is the same for all realizations. So the, this deterministic um, ballistic velocity is necessary in order, in order to even talk about the diffusive order. And then we, we scale around that with the square root of t. This is computed by using uh, um, second order perturbation theory of the same operator that I showed you before. And uh, this gives you Gaussians. And you do this again separately for every p in some sense. So you get a p dependent spread of the momentum distribution. Uh, sorry, of the, of, the, of the asymptotic uh, scale position. Uh, and there's actually a formula for this. Uh, for this variance that, that you have to evaluate it, which is kind of complicated. You have to solve the linear equation to get it. I don't want to bother you with that. So, but, but you basically get a closed expression. Um, and you see things like um, if, the, if, if the walk is, there are limits in which, oh, I, I think it is, no, I, I erased that. There are limits in which you get back to the, to, the co to the coherent case. For example, when you stay very long with a single point, then you have, then the thing moves ballistically for a long time, right? Because you have a fixed wall. And then, and then you switch to another one. So this means that you, that this diffusion constant diverges because you make very large excursions. Also, if all the coins are nearly the same, the diffusion constant diverges. So, so, uh, and, and so there are various limits when you go back to the deterministic. So from here, I would say it's an others. Thanks. Uh, okay. okay, so um, I will speak about the um, quench disorder, as Rana already told you. And um, if you have a look here, that's just the recap of how Rana de defined the quantum walk with um, the coin operations, and this is clearly a translation invariant, that thing. Um, but now the question is. Well, assume that, that from your bank house you weren't able to get all these infinite one euro coins, right? And then the question is, what will you do? Uh, one possibility is you go to the box that you have at home, um, where you throw all the coins in that you couldn't get rid of at the airport for when you're leaving from the last conference, right? And then your walk looks like this. So you draw a random coin at each position, and we assume that you have a large box and you went to a large number of conferences last year, 
uh, that all these coins, but you can assume that you have drawn these coins identically and um, well, independent right, for every position. And uh, afterwards, you, you fix this configuration of points, and then you switch on your time evolution, and that evolves the system, and the question is, what, what will happen now? So we've seen that in the time disordered case, um, something like well, classical behavior can be observed, and yeah, then so diff diffusion in the end, and the question is, will here happen the same or not? And just as a little example, um, we will look at the flip operator. So imagine we have an undisturbed walk. So every of these blue dots stands, for example, for Hadamard gate or for a Hadamard point. And we just disturb these two um, and choose some flip gates there. And the question is, what happens at these boundaries? And we start our particle localized. Uh, in the middle of these two. Right? Okay, and then if we arrive at the border there, um, we have a, the, the, the shift operation will still be perfect yeah, and coherent, so the particle moves to the left, and now we flip the internal state, and the particle will afterwards move to the right. Okay, and well, that's perfect reflection there, so we can't cross. This border. And you could say that if you start the particle within two of these flip operations, or these flip points, then uh, you have something like strict localization there. Right? So there's nothing, no, no, there's not much random things going on. And so the question is if I just with some probability uh, put in a flip somewhere <coughs> on my lattice. Right? So red dots would uh, correspond to, to a flip operation. And okay, then I can calculate the probability. And I would could ask something like, what's the probability that the walker reaches some side x uh, at a given time t? And that's, uh, of course, smaller than the probability that uh, no flip occurred up to that side. And then you can compute all these numbers. And what you see is that uh, the probability goes down exponential in the, um, in the distance between the starting point and the point x I'm asking for. Right? And that's also some kind of localization. So some transition probability goes down exponentially. And we can well generali generalize this idea in this way. So we start a particle somewhere, put a detector at a, some, some other place of our lattice, and we say if the transition probability going from uh, the left side, no, the right side, to the left side uh, is suppressed exponentially, we will say that, the particle, uh, that uh, we have localization there. And um, because it's, a, well, it's a dynamical statement, right? Um, we look at the time evolution and prepare something, you would speak of uh, dynamical localization here, and you can make that precise. So the delta x uh, down there would be such a localized particle at site x, and the phi would be some well, arbitrary internal state of our walking particle. And uh, okay, then we, we would uh, demand that in the mean, over all possible realizations, right? Um, the transition probability from one uh, from from one side to the other is suppressed exponentially in the distance of these two points. Um, and well, I, I said that that it's what you would call a dynamical localization, but you could also ask for other. Uh, kinds of localization. So, for example, you could ask what the localized state should look like, right? And here is some definition for that. So, um, I look at all times, right? And uh, if I find the particle for some distance uh, in a fixed spatial region, right? Then I would say uh, the the particle is localized. So the p here just projects onto some 
part of my lattice. T is equal to n. Pardon? T is equal to n. And T is equal to n here. Yes, of course. So that's time, and since our time is discrete, it's get, it gets an n. Right? <laughs> Um, and this, so I can do the same thing for delocalized states, and also T and L should be the same. And uh, of course, if I can't find any finite region or where the particle will stay in for all time, so that just means it moves away. So could, you could speak of scattering state, right? So the particle escapes to infinity with probability one in some sense. Um, and you can, could ask, well, how can I, if I look on my um, time evolution, so on the W, can I say something about um, whether I have localized states or delocalized states? And indeed you can, that's the support rate theorem. And, well, that's uh, after the authors, well, uh, Enns and two other guys, so it's not, yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, and it uh, tells you that you, you just have to look at the time evolution at the W, and if you have pure, pure point spectrum, right? So particles, uh, particles, uh, wave functions or states corresponding to the pure point spectrum correspond to localized states, and the delocalized ones just correspond to the absolutely continuous spectrum. Uh, okay, then I speed up. I want to say so that's not the full story. In uh, infinite dimensions, you could also have a singularly continuous spectrum of your operator. But if you just care about whether you have localized states, you just have to exclude them both, right? So uh, your task is to prove something like pure point spectrum for your operator. Um, that's not the same as dynamical localization I showed you before. Um, it's a bit weaker, right? so from dynamical localization it follows the spectral localization time, but it's not the other way around. Okay, so then uh, to come back to our disordered walk case, so that's just uh, the mathematics, so at each point we choose some um, unitary as a point operator and everything else stays the same, so we still have the perfect shift operation, nothing new there. Um, and here, well, I think that's just two examples what will happen. So the red one is again the undisturbed Hadamard walk. Um, here we have some small amount of disorder, right? And you see that, well, at fir firstly, it's um, not as quick as a Hadamard walk, right? So the, the blue wiggles are a bit behind these large red peaks. And also you see that it gets damped and uh, in the middle it piles up. And that's also the, um, the probability distribution for finding the particle somewhere in this. Okay. And if you increase the, order, uh, the, the disorder, well, that looks quite localized, I would say. And exponential decay towards the end. And you can also make this precise. So if you choose your uh, random unitary coin at each position, um, yeah, according to, to uh, well, absolutely continuous to the harm measure, you can indeed prove this um, uh, dynamic localization. Um, it's a bit sad because uh, what, what it says basically is um, that you lose your quadratically speed up, and uh, even more, um, you even get worse than in the classical case, right? So in the classical case, you still had this um, diffusive spreading, but now the, the particle just gets stuck somewhere in between. I think it's a fun, funny effect because, well, you, you would think that coherence helps you normally, but here you have, the, you have a coherent unitary evolution and it's even worse than the classical case. And uh, yeah, well, to sum up, the first two points I had uh, told you about. Um, here it's stated again in the spectral type. So for a translation invariant walk, you will indeed get this quadratic speed up uh, over the classical case, so ballistic spreading. Um, if you have some randomness in time, so you choose a new coin 
at every time step, uh, you can end up in a situation where you have diffusive spreading. And even worse, in the, if you disturb the coin in the spatial direction, uh, well, there might be no spreading at all. Yeah. 